which is the only reason you should start any compliance program. Um, it wasn't that hard when it came time to work through compliance because we were doing all the right things already. Um, and so it was just a matter of shoehorning them into which boxes we could check. But I think if you make the mistake of starting off your security program and building your security organization around the idea that you're going to go through a compliance uh, uh, regimen later, you're, you're probably not doing the right things. And I'm going to describe what I think the right things are. <coughs> With this nifty graphic. This is the only graphic in the whole presentation. Um, I think that there's a, there's a triangle of, of things that you need to act upon and think about in, uh, in security. And the base, the one we all know, the one that vexes us every day is this endless amount of vulnerabilities. If I could make this base nearly infinite, I would because of all the things that it would encompass. But really the only vulnerabilities that I care about are ones that if they're exploited are going to actually cause damage to my organization. There may be a ton of vulnerabilities that may be relevant, may not be relevant, but if someone attacks them and exploits them and they, I have other controls and other things set up, um, I don't really care about those vulnerabilities, so I, I don't really need to, to mess with them. And threats are those vulnerabilities, the ones that are going to have damage to your organization. Even if you have threats, if no one's attacking you, you really don't even have to worry about those. And I know that we're all getting attacked all the time, but we're not getting attacked all the time in a targeted and focused manner. We're getting attacked by a bunch of botnets, we're getting attacked by a bunch of random crap floating through the network. but there may only be one or two or 10 or 20 people or 50 people who are actually targeting you. And the attacks are, those attacks are the ones you have to worry about. And if you look at those attacks, watch those attacks, you can find out who those 10, 20, 50 people are and go after them. So the bottom, threats and vulnerabilities, is really where I think most of the industry focuses on. Definitely on the cataloging of vulnerabilities, figuring out how to, what they're affecting, and trying to tell people whether or not they're threatening. But only you and your organization can, can actually understand what the threats are because a component of the threat is figuring out the risk to your, to your organization. And no external company is going to be able to tell you that. Also, no external company is going to necessarily be able to see and act on all your attacks. So at Facebook, I really focused on the top two portions of this, where when we were getting attacked, looking at the attacks and figuring out as much information as we could about what was being attacked, well, who was doing it, why they were doing it, and then going after them uh, any way we could. So uh, this is just kind of a recap of the last thing. So the vulnerabilities are the complete possible ways into your systems. That number approaches infinity as, as your systems grow especially. The threats are a subset of that that would actually cause harm to your organization and you're really the only people that can understand that inside your organization. Oh yeah, your boss yelling at you is, is harm in the organization too. <laughs> Attacks are people that have figured out those threats and are working them, going after them, and that is your number one place to gain information about actors, and the actors are the people who are going after you. I think uh, there's a tendency in the organization because of so many botnet attacks, because of so much stuff in the network that's out there, to just look at its attacks as being, uh, uh, you know, like weather, it just happens. And it's not something that you can really do anything about, except it is something you can do things about. Most attacks that are focused on you are being done by someone. And those people live in the real world, they're real people, they're doing it for a bunch of reasons, generally money, and if you can follow the money, follow the people, you can, you can stop real attacks. So, uh, when I've done this, when I've talked about this before, I say ignore vulnerabilities and that always sets people off. So this time I decided to put ignore in quotes. Um, I kind, but I still kind of mean ignore in that don't chase vulnerabilities. Don't, it's like chasing the needle if you're flying a plane. Go after the ones that matter. Don't go after all of them because you're just going to be, it's never ending work and you're going to end up introducing more vulnerabilities and then you're just going to have to do it all over again. So really identify the ones that are important to you about threats and go after those vulnerabilities that are actually part of the threats. And when thinking about threats, really be realistic about what's going to matter, what's really going to affect your organization, and think about it in a way that greater restriction of information flow doesn't necessarily mean greater security, but it definitely means degraded capabilities. <coughs> and, you know, this is a big one for, for me, is I decided early on at Facebook to trust the people inside the network. 
and a lot of um, security organizations don't want to trust people. And I thought, if you can't trust your people, nothing you do from a technological standpoint is going to matter. And if you don't trust your people, why not? F go figure that out. <coughs> so, spend your time watching attacks. They will tell you everything you need to know about who's attacking you. And if you watch enough of them and you get enough of them, you'll actually start to be able to track tools and see, hey, this attack was a person writing a tool. This is the person they, they sold it to who's testing it out. And then they sold it on to someone else who's actually using it against you. And collecting that data, you can end up really building an association network and figure out how to break the chain, how to break the money, how to make it to uh, too much trouble. Target the actors. They have reasons for attacking you. If you figure out what they are, and they could be technical, they could not be technical. Like I said, it's often money. And go break the money for them, break, the, break their reasons, and make it too hard. And they'll end up stopping or just going on somewhere else, which is a win for your organization. <coughs> and this is, uh, this is something I believe really strongly. It's uh, every time someone interacts with you, and, and from this standpoint, I'm really thinking about it as a website uh, like, like Facebook, where every time someone interacted with Facebook, be it getting a page, looking at a page, doing a ping, uh, trying to do scripting thing, do something, it was an opportunity for us to collect intelligence on people and then analyze that to see if they were attacks or not attacks. And um, every site, every application, I would argue even every OS should have some sort of capability for that. Um, obviously they don't. Okay. So how do we bring these two things together? How do we bring these ideas around U.S. cyber warfare and ideas on cybersecurity that have been in use at Facebook? and think about going forward, are these things even connected? Do they need to be connected? Why not? I argue they do. Because talking about some of the influences earlier, cybersecurity and cyber warfare are not even two sides of the same coin, uh, unless they're maybe on the same side. I mean, <laughs> they, are, they are definitely connected and interrelated, and thinking about them is the same way. <coughs> Is it, oh, so is it even possible or relevant to think about a unified doctrine? Well, let's see. Uh, if you think about a large site like Facebook or even a small site, uh, any site, and you think about um, government and the nation's information infrastructure, are they going to have the same types of threats against them? Maybe. Uh, if they're attacked, are they going to respond in similar ways? I think so. So if you have unified threats and a unified method of responding, you probably have the ground there to build some sort of unified doctrine. So something that I think uh, that I have noticed from talking to government about cyber warfare and the way they think about cyber warfare is they view the front lines as being the edges of the dot .mil and dot .gov domains. And you know, it's easy to, to view things that way because that's really the extent of their authority. Um, and the government doesn't really like to think about things that are outside of its authority. But in reality, those attacks are going to occur much earlier than that. Um, attacks are happening at telcos. Attacks are happening at ISPs. And attacks are happening at big sites. And so if you're doing, res if you're doing security in any of those areas, which is, you know, pretty much all of the internet, uh, you are on the front line of the cyber war. And thinking about how to respond to that and, and responding to it in a way that is as if you're acting that way, instead of doing it in an information security compliance mode, may change the way that you react to things. So if someone attacks you as uh, a security person, do you really have any idea when that attack starts or when you first see the attack, whether it's just a hobbyist trying something out, playing with the site, whether it's a criminal that's actually attacking you or whether it's some organized state, state attack. I would argue that you don't actually know that and that um, at the time that the attack is going on, and you may never know that depending on how much information you can gather around it. So not knowing that, <coughs> um, and also as it progresses, you may not know that they're progressing from one to another. You may identify something as a hobbyist first. It may end up being a test later on for a military actor that doesn't go against you even. 
So how would you respond? I don't think, I would argue that it doesn't matter. That the way that you respond to these attacks really doesn't matter based on whether or not they're a script kid or uh, um, a criminal or a military. You're going to respond in the same way, which is you're going to try and protect your assets, protect the things that you're responsible for, gain information, try and find the people. <coughs> so whether or not there are any of those classes really doesn't matter in your response. And how you do the things. The, uh, how you string together the tactical actions that you have, how you gather the intelligence also doesn't change based upon whether it's military or hobby or criminal. So I think you're going to see the same threats because you're on the front lines. You're going to respond to those threats regardless of whether or not they're coming from someone who's just experimenting or from a state actor in the same way. And they're going to be the same threats and same responses in government as well as outside of government. So there probably is some ground for a unified doctrine between those two things. What does it look like? I'm going to throw out some requirements and things here of what I think it would look like. <coughs> I think it should absolutely uh, encompass the security idea of identifying the actors behind the attacks and uh, using everything that happens in interacting with your systems as intelligence to do that and basing your responses on behavior, not identity, since you don't necessarily know at the beginning in the tactical response who's doing it or why, but you need to respond. Uh, I make an assumption that throughout the internet all the hosts are equally suspect. So you can trust people but don't trust machines. That uh, users and machines that are roughly in the same class of activity are going to look alike and they're going to enable you to build a statistical model describing what a good action is versus a bad action. And these things here are actually things that we, that we did on Facebook. So, um, you know, we, we make decisions at Facebook about when you're interacting with the site whether or not we think you're a script or whether you're a real person and that's all based upon the behavior that you're, that you're exhibiting. And um, we compare that against a model of all the users and see are you, doing, are you doing like what are you, other users are doing or are you not? And to the extent you fall out of the model, we'll start degrading your service based on that. And I think that that's a model that you can use on all levels of, uh, of uh, cybersecurity support. So I'm going to suggest a doctrine here. <coughs> um, and I think that this doctrine from, from my reading and my understanding and talking to people actually uh, it's an existing military doctrine. Actually, maps pretty well to something that would work well for cybersecurity and cyber warfare. Um, but it's not something that, that generally anyone really brings up. It's not one of the metaphors that I've that I've heard a lot. And that's um, a counterinsurgency. So some of the define. Well, I'll get into some of the defining points um, because I think it's because I told you I'm really going to say cyber about a million times during this presentation. I decided that uh, the doctrine that I'm going to talk about is going to be called. Cyber counterinsurgency or C-Coin. <laughs> um, so under this doctrine, here's some of the things that I think would, would reflect it. Um, under a human cyber insurgency, um, I mean, people act in certain ways and, and you can't really tell the difference between who's, in a, who's a combatant and who's not a combatant until they behave a certain way. And I think that's the same for hosts, IP addresses, packets being flown, all those things reflect human behavior. Be it a person actually behind the keyboard doing something or something that they've written that's running on the machine, but everything that happens on the network doesn't happen because machines make it happen, they happen because we make it happen. So given those that everything is reflecting some sort of human behavior, <coughs> um, and, and I'm going to call these things for the rest of the discussion, I'm going to call that stuff subjects. So subjects are the behavior that's exhibited by technology that's human based. It could be packets, it could be the way that someone's going on a web page, it could be files written to disk. These things are all subjects. <coughs> and all the subjects live in this big country called the interwebs. I call it that, I don't, I don't know what you guys call it. Um, and this country doesn't have any real law enforcement or governance. So uh, there's no intrinsic police telling these subjects what to do. It's all driven on the user's human behavior, the person who wrote the software's human behavior, the things that they want it to do. And the subjects interact with each other. 